Hi, Olivia here. Welcome to Quantum Business Insights, where each week we explore new perspectives on the changing nature of business with thought leaders from around the world. And I like to put a special emphasis on what I feel is our most valuable asset, our human capital. Today, I am thrilled to have as my guest, Dr. Rian Eisler, and today we'll be discussing the real wealth of nations, creating a caring economics. But let me just tell you a little bit about Rian. She is a social scientist, an attorney, and an author whose work on cultural transformation has impacted many fields, including history, economics, psychology, sociology, and even education. And many of you may remember her interview international bestseller, The Chalice and the Blade, Our History, Our Future, which is available in 25 more languages. So today we'll be discussing current, her current work based on a recent book, The Real Wealth of Nations, Creating a Caring Economics, which was hailed by Desmond Tutu as, quote, a template for the better world we have been so urgently seeking. So Rian, welcome to Quantum Business Insights. It's a pleasure to be with you, Olivia. Thank you. So we often hear politicians say that the free market works best for everybody. In Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, he says, we need to just trust the invisible hand of the market. It's the best mechanism for producing and distributing the necessities of life. And there are still a lot of political parties that say that today. But in your book, The Real Wealth of Nations, you say that we need to reevaluate the free market capitalism that so what's wrong with capitalism why do you suggest that we replace it well i am actually not suggesting that we replace capitalism as such in the sense of a free market uh, i am suggesting uh, among other things first of all that we don't have a free market uh, we don't. You can't even begin to talk about a free market when you have these mega corporations that uh, really control so much of the market. Number two, uh, there are elements in capitalism, especially in what is curiously called neoliberalism, because it's neither new nor liberal, uh, <laughs> that are really very, very bad such as trickle-down economics, which is just a return, actually, to the old notion from feudal, monarchic times, be they Western or Eastern, when people were to content themselves with the scraps dropping from the opulent tables of those above, right? Right, uh, literally. Literally, <laughs> okay. And, and, and that's what trickle-down economics, as for all that talk about freedom, it's really... Uh, translates into what they really mean, which is freedom for those on top to do what they want, free from government or other regulation, including destroying our natural habitat. Which takes me really to the third point. Yes, we need markets. Uh, we certainly also need government planning and regulation. Uh, but we have to really go beyond both of those. Uh, which is why I have proposed in the Real Wealth of Nations that what we need is, uh, well, something that's based on what we know is the real wealth of a nation. You spoke of human capital. We know today uh, that the real wealth of a nation of the world is not really financial. I mean, you see that every day with the stock market, right, going up, down, mm. up, down, <laughs> yeah. with all those credit swaps that disappeared into thin air, that it mm -hmm. consists of the contributions of people and of nature. So we need an economic system that gives visibility and value through measurements policies and practices to the most important human work, the work of caring for people, starting in early childhood. You know, that's the, we know from neuroscience that that's really fundamental for whether we do or do not have that high-quality human capital and mm -hmm. caring for nature. So what I propose in The Real Wealth of Nations is basically that neither capitalism nor socialism, both of which are came out of theoretical analysis there. 200 year old out of the industrial age have to be uh, re-examined and that we need is a different economics, what I call a caring 
economy. I see. So I know a little bit about your history, but I would love to have you share for your, for my listeners because I think one of the things you say is this is what led you to this this interest in caring economics. So tell my listeners a little bit about your past, please. Well, I have, uh, it's interesting, I sometimes think of my life as the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle uh, <laughs> coming together. I um, certainly professionally, I have a very varied background. Uh, I was uh, really one of the first people in what we today call system science, mm. uh, which basically uh, rests on a very simple premise, which is that you can't really understand much less change systems by just looking at one element uh, at a time. Uh, just right. as if you just look at a part of a picture, you don't see the whole picture. You don't see the connections, the interactions, right, right. that maintain or change the system. Um, I also have a background in social science. I have a background uh, in law. I, I'm a, I have a law degree. Uh, and my personal background is what really also animates my research and my writing, uh, which is basically uh, the search for answers to a very fundamental question that arose early in my life as a refugee, refugee child from Nazi Europe, uh, oh. which is when we humans have such an enormous capacity for empathy, uh, yes, for caring, <laughs> for creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, why has there been so much insensitivity, uh, cruelty, and destructiveness? Does it have to be this way, as we're so often told, you know, original sin, selfish genes, or are there alternatives? And if so, what are these? And that uh, research, multidisciplinary, cross-cultural research, is what eventually led to my the book that you mentioned, The Chalice and the Blade, which now is in 25 uh, foreign editions, all the way to my latest book, The Real Wealth of Nations, focusing on economics, because that is so fundamental. But, and this is really basic, you can't really understand economics, economics doesn't arise in a vacuum, just like families don't arise in a vacuum. You have to understand the underlying uh, cultural context. And that's what The Real Wealth of Nations is about. And it's a very practical book. And it's also the basis for the Center for Partnership Studies Caring Economy Campaign, which, uh, as you know, because you've been in uh, our, one of our online programs, uh, mm -hmm. is really a very important tool uh, for better understanding and spreading that understanding and then changing as needed our present economic measurements, policies, and practices. Right. So where are, are there places around the world where countries are actually doing this very well? Well, yes. And that's really the tragedy um, we know so many things that really work. And as I bring out again and again in The Real Wealth of Nations, uh, caring not only is essential in human and environmental terms, but in purely financial terms, especially now as we move from the industrial to the post-industrial service knowledge economy, where economists never tire of telling us that the most important capital is this high-quality human capital. And I really uh, want to emphasize here that uh, we're talking about human development, what we know from neuroscience today, which is that our brains develop in interaction with our environments and that the quality of care and education children receive early on is fundamental for a successful economy, which takes me directly to your question. Uh, if you look at um, nations uh, such as Sweden, Finland, uh, Norway, Iceland, uh, these are nations that have a generally high quality of life for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and these are nations that have much more caring policies. Uh, these are nations that, uh, in many ways, weathered 
the Great Recession much better than the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are nations that have invested in caring for people and for nature. But as you know, this did not happen, again, in a vacuum. It happened because these nations um, uh, really have moved more to what I call the it's a continuum from a domination system to a partnership system. So, for example, uh, our nation, our wealthy nation, has the highest child poverty rates, the highest infant mortality rates, the highest maternal mortality rates of any developed nation. Uh, These, uh, you know, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Iceland, have very low poverty rates low maternal mortality rates. Uh, I mean, there's just no comparison. And, of course, it's so interesting because Americans say, well, we certainly don't want, they consider this socialist, but it actually is not socialist. Uh, They very often call themselves what they are, caring societies. Mm. So what are some of the policies or characteristics of a company that has, say, a caring economic policy? Well, you know, um, let me start by saying that, again, in the real wealth of nations, as you know, uh, there are uh, study after study uh, showing that uh, companies that really have policies that care for their people, good health care, paid parental leave, flex time, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of policies, child care, in other words, caring policies, uh, that these companies, I mean, if you look, for example, at studies of the companies that are regularly uh, in the best companies to work for in working mothers or the 500, uh, these companies have a substantially higher return to investors. And it makes a lot of sense because, of course, Uh, When people feel that they and their families are cared for, they want that company to succeed, don't they? And they work hard to make it so. So uh, it it is not to say that uncaring companies can't do well, especially under the present economic rules of the game. But it doesn't Mm -hmm. have to be that way, okay? We can actually change those rules to penalize harmful activities, and to reward uh, those that really contribute, including contributing uh, to the next generation of our human capital, uh, of of people's human development. Interesting. So I'm curious, in those companies, is there less of a discrepancy in pay between, say, the CEO and the average worker? You know, I um, really haven't looked at that, but I would say, for example, if you look at a company like Costco, uh, I think that the discrepancy is much less. And it's I've very, heard that. And very mm-hmm. interestingly, in Costco, when, you know, the um, bubble burst, uh, you know, in 2008, and uh, mm-hmm. everybody was letting workers go, the CEO of Costco got everybody together and said, we're not going to let anybody go. Wow. We are going to make this work for everybody. And it's a highly successful company. Yeah, and I think they all get a living wage, which is much higher than a lot of other types of stores like that. It's very inspiring. Yeah, yeah but so it can be done, and it is successful. Uh, but, and this is where we go back to the larger cultural context, uh, a lot of people think there are only two possibilities. You either dominate or you're dominated, Right. Right, And they don't see the partnership alternative, the fact that we can have structures uh, that really uh, work better for everyone. That doesn't mean that it's a completely flat structure. There have mm-hmm. to be some hierarchies, but I call them hierarchies of actualization uh, rather oh. than hierarchies of domination. We need new words, really. So, So if you were... 
proposing that, what would be some of the measures that you might use to replace, I guess, what they look at now, which is quarterly earnings? What What are some other measures that might work for this? Well, quarterly earnings are a disaster because, <laughs> um, I mean, yes, they're supposed to protect the shareholder. But what they really do is they set up a situation that makes what's essential for long-term economic viability and success, not only for a company, but for a nation, impossible. Right. And actually, I've been talking to some people that are really saying innovation is critical now, but it's very hard to get companies because that's definitely not something that you see a return in a quarter. So I think there's other pressures that are going to force companies to get away from this. I just hope it happens soon enough to save us. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we're talking, I mean, you asked about other measures, and what we are working for through the Caring Economy campaign, in addition to our, our wonderful webinars, online webinars, um, to really provide this information and provide the opportunity for people to take leadership and in, in changing the system, because that's how things happen. You know, they don't happen by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also working on uh, changing our measures nationally of what is economic health. Because, I mean, clearly, GDP does not measure our nation's economic health. You know, I mean, we saw mm -hmm. that uh, GDP can go up at the same time that unemployment goes up, that foreclosures go up. Mm -hmm. uh, GDP actually includes as productive work activities that uh, harm and even take life. You know, cigarettes, right? Uh, right. Selling, making and selling cigarettes, and then the medical bills, and then the funeral bills. They're all great for GDP. They're all part of GDP, oh. aren't they? Right. But, That's true. But That's these true. measures fail to include what we were talking about, which is the work of caring for people, you know, and for nature. So I've proposed in the Real Wealth of Nations, as you know, what I call a full-spectrum economic map. The old economic theories, both capitalist and socialist, came out of industrial times about 200 years ago, and we're now in the post-industrial knowledge service economy. So we really need to assess uh, just what uh, should we be examining. Now, if you look at economic textbooks, if you look at GDP, what uh, that looks at are basically only three sectors, the market economy, of the government economy, and to some extent, the legal economy. But the three life-sustaining sectors, the natural economy, the volunteer community economy, and the household economy are nowhere represented in terms of productivity. Quite the contrary, according to both Smith and Marx, uh, the work of caring for people in households, you know, that so-called women's work, uh, mm -hmm. that was not even productive work for them. That was just reproductive work. And that <laughs> vocabulary continues, just as this ridiculous vocabulary of considering what really impacts our lives, externalities, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so we've got to change the language, for goodness sakes, because that's the only way we can change the thinking. So, but once you take into account the three sectors, well, that that produce uh, human beings, that produce human capital, that produce the resources, you know, the natural resources on which we depend to survive and and breathe, even. Well, then you really begin to see uh, what is needed as uh, a supplement, at least if not a replacement, eventually, of GDP. And it's what we call social wealth economic indicators. And mm -hmm. as you said, you can find information about them at caringeconomy.org. But what we're talking about here is measuring what are 
uh, the drivers in a society that make it possible, uh, well, for one thing, for everyone to realize her or his full capacities, Mm. right? Right. Uh, So we are looking at uh, how much, what is the, the, the state of our human capital. I already mentioned for our nation, uh, well, if you look at infant mortality, if you look at maternal mortality, if you look at child poverty, I mean, right there, you have dismal indicators of the state of our human capital. If you look at our health indicators, right? I mean, dismal indicators of our human capital. If you look at how our children uh, do I mean I I teach in a PhD program and uh, I have wonderful students but then there are students who don't know how to write at all it's and who scary. have no vocabulary. <laughs> I, uh, and I just I was going to say I just heard today on the news that all of our in the last decade with all the efforts to help bring up the education levels they've actually dropped in many places. It's really, it's really depressing. Well, it's not surprising, is it? No. <clears throat> I mean, teaching to the test, gosh, we all crammed for tests. Do you remember anything? Uh, no, right. Of and, course not, because I mean, it, uh, uh, cramming for a test is uh, a useless endeavor. It doesn't measure your development, your skill a development, your knowledge acquisition, your, the development of your critical faculties, the development of your mm-hmm. creative faculties. And by the way, that really has to start very early on. Uh, and, and yet, again, if you look at our indicators, uh, and this would be the second type of indicators for social wealth indicators, how much are we investing mm-hmm. in developing uh, human capacity? Well, I mean, uh, we are investing so little in early childhood education. Uh, mm-hmm. It's pathetic. I mean, and it is, uh, you know, I, I gave a, a talk at the Academy of Management. Uh, it was interesting. It was in a, um, at their annual conference, and the theme was actually Dare to Care. So naturally, they invited me to give a keynote. And <laughs> I found out that in Montreal, you can get... Uh, child care for $7 a day by a highly trained, unionized, well-paid child care provider. Wow. Yeah. Well, but there's a reason for that. It's because the province of Montreal recognizes that this is an investment. It's government subsidized. It's an Mm -hmm. investment in human capital. So we are going in the opposite direction in the United States. And you really wonder uh, how people can be so blind in our legislatures. I mean, yes, uh, President Obama did talk about uh, early childhood education. On the other hand, this whole race to the top, and uh, the, which is still teaching to the test, is absolute mm-hmm. nonsense. And, and, yeah. and every... Every educator who really works in the trenches, in the classroom, will tell you what's needed is, first of all, parenting education as part of the school curriculum uh, to help parents uh, help their children develop. Yeah, I know. I mean, and it's not just reading, which a lot of parents don't because they weren't read to, but it's not using violence against children. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, and of course, then there is the issue of, of, of malnutrition, of hunger. Yeah. I mean, kids can't learn if they, I don't care how much t- teaching to the test you do here. So right. anyway, uh, we have some very, very misguided policies. But, and that's why we have the Caring Economy campaign, because frankly, you have to both influence policymakers, which right now is very difficult, given what's going mm-hmm. on or isn't going on in Washington, mm-hmm. D.C., but you also have to invest in uh, changing thinking on the ground. So that's why we have our webinars, and we also have our Caring Economy Coalition, which I really want to encourage people to get their organizations to sign up. Um, we now have organizations representing 16 million people. 
That's as great. part of the Caring Economy Coalition. Well, but now uh, we have to have support uh, for enough staff and enough uh, resources to really engage all of these organizations. Right. And, you know, that uh, that takes money. So if anybody wants to uh, really support this and has the means or knows foundations that mm-hmm. are really trying to change uh, the floor, you know, because otherwise we're just doing remedial work, aren't we? Yeah, and this seems like a perfect opportunity for some sort of Kickstarter or Internet based campaign. So we'll have to think about that, get some... Young. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have you uh, uh, direct such a campaign, Olivia. That would be wonderful. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I would love to, and, and maybe I can find some talent to actually put it together. But I would think most people would want this because most people have people, either they work for a company that they would prefer had better caring policies or they have children or grandchildren um, that I just don't see. I think there are maybe a few small, powerful industries that benefit from the status quo. But other than that, I just think there's um, it would just benefit everybody. So I will definitely look into that. Well, you know, it is a process of changing uh, it's, 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 you know, awareness that there are problems. Yeah, that's part of it. But just critiquing things uh, is not how we're going to change things. We have to also provide viable alternatives. And that's really what uh, this work is about that I've been engaged in for the past 30 years. So have you seen some shifts? Have you um, oh, gosh, noticed? Yes. Oh, good. Well, look, I mean, let's start with something that I just mentioned in passing when I said hierarchies of actualization rather than hierarchies of domination. If you look at the management literature, you begin to see this movement towards a redefinition of the leader from, you know, somebody who gives orders that have to be obeyed or else there are terrible consequences, in other words, somebody who dominates, to mm-hmm. somebody who inspires, who guides, who elicits from others their highest potentials. In other words, leadership that is empowering rather than disempowering, right? Right. Uh, a very important part of the movement towards a more caring society, and yes, towards the partnership side of the continuum, is the rise in the status of women. Because Mm -hmm. uh, what we have inherited from earlier, more domination-oriented times is not only the subordination of the female half of humanity, but with it, uh, the devaluation of anything stereotypically associated with women or the feminine, including caring, right, and caregiving. Right, right. And, yep. and, and unless we address that, I mean, for example, I mentioned uh, Nordic nations like Sweden, Finland, Norway. Well, it's not coincidental that these nations that have more caring policies, that 40% of their national legislatures are women. That's great. Yeah, but, and, 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 you know, it's not every woman, uh, Olivia. I mean, uh, you know, there yeah. are women who are so identified with domination, right? And right. with the stereotypically masculine control, violence, you know. Right. Uh, that, uh, but, but, but women as a group do tend to vote for more caring policies. Moreover, and this is basic, only as the status of women rises do mm. men uh, no longer find it such a threat to their status, to their, quote, masculinity, to mm. also embrace more stereotypically feminine traits, activities, and policies, like all the men today who are feeding babies, diapering babies. You couldn't do that mm-hmm. when the status of women was so low, right? Right. Yeah, and I've even heard CEOs say that they have learned to trust their intuition and, you know, some more some other feminine qualities. And, and I've even noticed in the last mm, 10 years, maybe maybe a little bit longer, that men are hugging on stage 
we never saw that. But, you know, in the in the current political climate, men are hugging. I think that's kind of interesting um, well, and, you know, and heartening. <laughs> it's really, if you, I mean, I, I don't know whether you want to go that deep into uh, the new framework introduced by my work, but the struggle for our future really isn't between capitalism and socialism. I mean, look at the mess of the two large-scale applications of socialism, the former Soviet Union and China, you know, with their uh, violence, their control, and their horrible environmental policies. Uh, wow. It's it, And it's not between religious or secular. There can be terrible regimes that are religious or secular, uh, and so on, or East and West. It's between partnership and domination systems. And that's within all of these parts of the world, within everything. Mm-hmm. And once we become aware of that then we can pay attention to what are the interventions that have a cascade of systemic effects, which is what my work is about. And yes, changing the economic measurements, economic policies, and economic practices is one of the key interventions. So if you have a company that would like to embrace this, have you done projects or worked with consultants that have gone in and kind of What would be the first step, I guess, is my question. Well, if you possibly can, you do try to engage the top management because that Mm -hmm. can make a huge difference uh, to have them really get it. Uh, Unfortunately, the way that the system of rewards has been set up Um, very often the people who make it to the top, whether it's a man or a woman, by the way, Mm. are the ones who are deeply steeped in the domination system. Right, because that's how you win, basically, in this culture. Well, and they don't understand that everything doesn't have to be a win-lose. I mean, that uh, expression win-win, which Mm -hmm. has become such a cliche, uh, really is talking about partnership, isn't it? And again, I want to say that this is not about flat organizations. It certainly isn't about just cooperating. I mean, people cooperate all the time in domination systems. Monopolies cooperate. (laughs) uh, Terrorists cooperate. Criminal gangs cooperate. It's really about this configuration of what I've identified and others have now identified as the configuration of a domination system or a partnership system. And you have to then pay attention to areas that are not yet part of the uh, mainstream political conversation, which is, yes, the status of women, uh, the status of children. You know, the fact that we now, you ask me progress, the fact that we hear today about women's rights, about children's rights as human rights, which is, by the way, an area where I really have played uh, a very active role. I wrote the first article for the Human Rights Quarterly back in 1987 on what since then has become known as women's rights as human rights. And the latest piece that I wrote for a Cambridge University Press book uh, is on using international law, the Rome Statute, uh, 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 etc., Uh, to protect the majority, women and children, which many, many nations will not still have, you know, I mean, still have no, not even laws, much less enforcing them, you know, Mm -hmm. protecting the human rights of women and children. You have to look at those because they're foundational. That's where people first learn Mm -hmm. uh, whether the only alternatives are dominating or being dominated or whether you can have hierarchies of actualization rather than domination. People like to talk about a more uh, just society, but, you know, consider, for example, that they still think of issues that affect uh, half of humanity, women, as just women's issues, so that they pay very little attention to something that you have to pay attention to if you're really realistically going to change uh, poverty, which is that... uh, the mass of the world's poor and the poorest of the poor are women and children. And that one of the reasons for this uh, is because of this 
hidden system of gendered values. For example, in the United States, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, women over the age of 65 are twice as likely to be poor as men of the same age. Now, that's not only because of workplace discrimination, which certainly is there, and it isn't because women live a slight amount more than men. It's because most of these women are or were either full or part-time caregivers, and their poverty is really their reward for it, Uh, not so in uh, nations that I mentioned earlier, and indeed in most Western European nations where there are uh, ways that support uh, caregiving work. You know, child care, women then can have both a career and a job or and or a job uh, and take care of children, etc. Uh, this is this is basic stuff. And mm-hmm. in the developing world where women do most of the subsistence work, you know, in Africa, uh, of caring for their families, uh, not only uh, in day-to-day terms, but water, uh, food, etc., you know, growing subsistence food, uh, you're going to continue poverty if you don't really invest. And yet the World Bank and the IMF, they're beginning to talk about it. It's very important. But they're not doing enough, okay? So, uh, gender and the change, we already touched on how the CEOs are beginning to, as you said, to talk about intuition. They're talking about caring now, right? Wow, right. Which yes. they wouldn't have before the status of women, at least in, in the West, rose. Well, and you mentioned earlier about the change from a more, uh, from a dominator sort of hierarchical management style to a more inspirational coaching kind of style. And I came to the same conclusion that that was necessary because of the work I do in data was making everything so complex and people had to be so specialized that no longer does the CEO know how to do the job of everybody under him. So if he gets upset and fires the COO, he could be in big trouble. And I think for that reason there's pressure for them to become more inspiring and less controlling, making perhaps fewer of the decisions, but letting that be brought about by his team or, you know, have ideas come from places other than the very top. So it it feels like there is a, a pressure there to use more feminine skills as well. And I remember an article in the Harvard Business Review, which I think is great because they always have at least one really good article that talks about the the human aspects of business. And they said that if a manager has compassion for their their direct report and and expresses it, that the mirror neurons actually sync up in their brains. And I just thought this was fascinating, you know, because you said you study neuroscience and I, I like when science backs up things that actually work and are leading to this more caring way of doing business. Well, and I think also having more women, um, Mm -hmm. I mean, because you said he, you know, the uh, CEO. (laughs) And I think that it's very important that we really consider that this is a a gender-neutral position. And Mm -hmm. uh, however, and this takes me back to the uh, uh, Scandinavian, to the Nordic nations, you have to have a certain number of women in leadership positions. Because if it's just one, it's very difficult. And it's also hard for women to get there because if they don't use the dominator model, it's harder. And if they do, then they end up having a lot of the same crimes. Um, And maybe that could is a good time to bring up your um, your caring economy leadership program. Maybe we could get leaders to come in and learn about this. So can you tell me more about that? Well, yes. And I think that's really so important uh, because it is really necessary today, as I said, to reexamine the old premises, the old assumptions. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we're really are just trying to do the same things uh, better, right? Right. And the same things aren't working. Faster. 
<laughs> yeah, faster. That's or right, mostly faster. For cheaper uh, money. <laughs> faster and cheaper, and they're not working. I mean, it just, mm-hmm. uh, for example, I mean, we are finding that so many jobs are never going to come back because mm-hmm. of automation, robotics, uh, down the way artificial intelligence. Uh, mm-hmm. Gosh, I mean, Amazon is talking about using drones now to I, deliver uh, goods. I mean, so you have to really start redefining what is productive work. And I'm not saying that I have all the answers in the Real Wealth of Nations or in our Caring Economy uh, program, but we certainly have some of them. So, yes, so I'd like to tell a little bit about the program. We have online wonderful, wonderful uh programs uh, for leaders uh, who, and everybody can be a leader, okay? I mean, that's the whole point of really of a partnership system. It, it's, it's a system where you can be a leader depending on the circumstances. As you said, you know, the CEO can't, can't just hang on. She or he can't hang on to everything. So you right. have to have people really on a team, who can take leadership where appropriate. Well, where appropriate now for us all to take leadership is in changing, first of all, the conversation about economics. Okay? Mm-hmm. Start talking about caring economy, and people will do a double take. And then you can point out what a terrible comment that is on how we've been brought up and socialized and brainwashed, really, to okay. accept that economic systems should be driven by uncaring values. And then start uh, talking, which is all the things that we learn in the caring economy, in the KELP programs. Uh, tremendous visuals are provided, tremendous resources. Uh, and it's a seven online sessions, uh, one and a half hours each, with a practicum where you get to present, as you mm-hmm. know, to a, a group uh, uh, and, and the groups vary. Oh, and we have now people taking this because it is online from 33 states and from 16 nations. We have a contingent from Kenya, for example, That's doing great. fabulous things there, both in the university there and in the community mm. in Nairobi. Is it- so is it mostly women, or do you have no? A we mixture? have men too. Although I have to say, uh, because of course care work, which is so invisible, so devalued, has been uh, pretty much considered quote women's work, and so many women, well, some more and more, you know, the largest group of homeless growth is women and children. Yeah, wow. and it is because this work is not given value. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. that simple. We, I mean, we need to have supports. We need, for example, caregiver tax credits. You know, we have tax credits for children, but the caregiver is invisible. Yes, and we consider our children probably our most valuable, I won't say possession, but thing that we care about the most and yet in our culture. The people that care for them probably make some of the lowest wages around. So. Oh, the uh, well, this is part of the information you get in these webinars. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, the average wage for caregivers is ten dollars an hour with no benefits, which is insane. Yeah, because it really they should is. be the best trained and um, highly rewarded. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and, and and of course, there's the issue of caring for the elderly too, isn't there? Yes. Which is huge. <laughs> so we're really talking about uh, a changing demographics. We're talking about a changing economic system where service, knowledge, uh, high-quality human capital are essential. So that is, and I also want to tell you about a course, and I teach in one of the uh, sessions. I love that part of it, where mm-hmm. I really get to interact. We keep the cohort small. Look, you can find out more about it at caringeconomy.org, and we have our new cohorts uh, starting in January. Great. And I also have my uh, cultural transformation online course starting at the beginning of February, which is a wonderful uh, course. Um, We um, have done it now twice to just raise as we get from the uh, the Caring Economy Leadership uh, Programs, and I uh, actually filmed four videos that people get 
uh, as part of the uh, course, and then we talk to one another, and uh, really, it, 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 we're forming a community, we're forming, we're building a movement, okay? Mm. And that's really what it's about, and it's a movement uh, that can really provide that foundation for so much of the intervention work, for so much of the remedial work, by looking at prevention. Yeah, and it seems like it's a nice fit with, say, the 99% movement and some of these other things that that have the pull for it, what you're talking about, but don't really have the structure. You have a lot of the structures already figured out and processes and measures and we That's really would great. like to invite people who are interested in the 99% in the Occupy movement uh, to really take these webinars because, mm-hmm. and we do offer some scholarships for people who can't afford, I mean, they're not that expensive at all. Uh, they're very yeah. reasonable. And that's one of the reasons that we also need donations to support, mm-hmm. you know, the scholarships. But that's what we offer, as you say, is a structure that's missing in these protest movements, which is, okay, mm-hmm. uh, what do we really need so that we can move forward? Right. Yeah, we know what we don't like, but a lot of people don't have the sense of what we do want, and that's what you're providing. So it's really powerful. So how does the cultural transformation program work? Is that um, It's also how- online, and it's mm-hmm. a five-session course. Mm-hmm. And um, for that one, we limit our enrollment uh, for the webinars because we want this community building. So for the CALP program, the, the leadership programs, we limit them to, I think, 12 or 15, I can't remember. The caring economy, I mean, the uh, cultural transformation program is limited to 25 people. But, okay. you know, uh, and and so it's, again, it's a way of really, and, oh, one of the lovely things now that we have is we have uh, our uh, graduate uh, webinars. So mm. we have... Uh, meetings of people who are focusing on health care. In fact, one of our alumni, Julie Kennedy, is developing a new uh, Kelp Caring Economy Leadership Program geared to health care workers. Oh, that's amazing. So, yeah, people could take in and focus and, and flesh out more specific um, processes for a certain industry. That's really interesting. And we're also uh, uh, among graduates from the... Uh, Help program. Uh, we're also working on a partnership journal. Mm, so, I mean, a lot of wonderful things are coming out of this community. But again, it takes resources. And I, mm. uh, if you go to our website, also you might want to check out the Rianne Eisler Social Action Facebook page. Oh, great! Yes. Oh. Uh, so you know, but I am making an appeal. It's that time of the year when people are thinking about tax deductions, mm-hmm. and uh, so I'm requesting, um, you know, tax deductible donations to the Center for Partnership Studies. You can do it online through PayPal. Through um, well, you you uh, can do it by going to. A partnershipway.org, which is the CPS website, we're working on changing that website, but uh, because it's, it it needs some revamping. Again, that takes resources. Right. But well, you can I'm... you can go do it through PayPal, or you can just mail a check. So you can find out all about it, um, and the check would be mailed to uh, uh, PO Box five one nine three six. Uh, mm-hmm. Pacific Grove, California, 93950, Center for Partnership Studies. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I'm just so grateful that you came on my show today. Um, we're just about out of time. And I just want to thank you so much. And I hope you'll come back and visit us again. I'd love to, Olivia. And thank all you. the best for the holidays to everyone. Oh, thank you. So be sure to tune in next week for my final show of the season. My guest will be Susanna Gargiulo. Susanna is a former producer for CNN, and she is currently founder and president of Story Lounge Media, a communications and consulting business working with companies to identify and create 
corporate social responsibility and communication strategies grounded in their unique vision of values, vision, and core competencies. So you won't want to miss this. Thank you for tuning into Quantum Business Insights. I'm your host, Olivia Parrood, and we'll see you next week. <music>